Thanks so much for coming, everybody. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, on all of our behalfs and welcome to the university, Professor Jeff Bailey, who is our Hood Fellow visiting the School of Social Sciences uh, at the University of Auckland. My name is Simon Holdaway. I'm head of uh, the School of Social Sciences and it's great uh, to see you all here. Jeff uh, Bailey took his uh, early training at the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cambridge and he held a lecturer position there until 1996 when he moved a little further north to Newcastle upon Tyne uh, where he had a, a chair of archaeology and he subsequently moved to the University of York in 2004 where he's currently the anniversary professor of uh, archaeology. He has a worldwide interest uh, in the field of uh, uh, coastal archaeology, coastal prehistory, the evolution of uh, terrestrial landscapes, and uh, he's run major fieldwork projects in Greece, Australia, the UK, and most recently in Saudi Arabia. He's currently principal investigator on a European Research Council uh, advance grant called Disperse, and chair of the European Research Network called Splash Costs, and he's going to explain what those acronyms stand for during his lecture. He's also a chair of a newly formed uh, commission, UISPP Commission on Coastal Prehistory and Submerged Landscapes. Jeff and I, uh, I guess uh, we share an interest in time theory, and we've uh, both worked on shell mounds uh, in the north of Australia. In fact, we're part of a, a project uh, at the top of working at the top of Cape York in an area. Uh, uh, close to Weipo, uh, looking at these shell mounds. Today's uh, lecture, in today's lecture, Jeff will talk about his interest in dynamic landscapes, particularly coastal uh, landscapes. And as I said, he'll explain some of the, those acronyms for the areas they work. So, please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you, Simon, for those words of introduction. Uh, let me also uh, record my thanks publicly uh, for being invited to the University of Auckland as a Hood Fellow and for the opportunity to be here in New Zealand uh, and to see the world from a New Zealand perspective and to see world archaeology from a New Zealand perspective, which already I'm learning is giving me some new ideas and insights and if there's time at the end I might tell you what I've learnt in the last week of travelling around. It's true that my theme is partly about coastlines and coastal landscapes but it's also about terrestrial landscapes as well. So I want to look at two big issues, they're both related to the, the, the big question of human dispersal uh, and I'll treat them separately but then try and bring them together uh, later on. The first big issue, and both these issues are very topical at the moment, is that big question about the origin and early geographical expansion uh, of the genus Homo. Uh, all our current evidence and the consensus from fossils, from genetics, from uh, chronology, from archaeology is that our origins are deeply rooted in Africa, particularly East Africa and South Africa, uh, with the emergence of the, the, the Homo lineage uh, sometime between three and two million years and then an expansion out of Africa at approximately 1.8 million years. Uh, and then there was a second wave of expansion associated with the evolution in Africa of Homo sapiens, our own species, sometimes referred to as modern humans, whatever modern means in this context, uh, from about a quarter of a million years onwards. And again, another uh, phase of expansion uh, between sometime after 150,000. The dates are very unclear here. But that expansion involved movement of people uh, to replace the pre-existing populations in Asia and Europe, perhaps to mingle with them a little bit, and to move the boundary of the human habitat much further afield, of course, into high latitudes, into the Americas, into Australia. So what lies behind these processes of expansion is, is a topic of great interest at the moment. 
Getting out of Africa is actually remarkably difficult. There's only one land route, and it's a very tight bottleneck across the Sinai Peninsula. There has been speculation that uh, there might have been sea crossings, which is the only other way to get out of Africa, going across the Mediterranean, uh, at the Strait of Gibraltar, or across to Italy, or through Crete into the Greek mainland. Some of these are very uh, topical at the moment, but there is no decisive evidence either way for those. There's a lot more evidence in favour of the crossing of the Southern Red Sea, and that's where we've been doing fieldwork, so I'll look at that in more detail later. But generally speaking, Africa is not easy to get out of, and of course you've got desert barriers periodically during arid episodes of climate to make the movement that much more constrained and difficult. The other theme that I want to look at is the coastal theme. Uh, coastal, maritime, marine resources and environments and where they fit into the bigger picture of human dispersal, human evolution. The most common and durable and visible archaeological expression of coastal settlement is shell mounds. This is one of the big ones from Weeper that um, uh, Simon mentioned. And sites like this, more or less big sites, appear in their thousands, in their tens of thousands, in their hundreds of thousands, all over the world sometime after about 8,000 years ago. And so dramatic is that change in the archaeological record that it's persuaded many archaeologists that this represents a post-glacial revolution, an intensification on marine resources, somewhat like the agricultural revolution on land. But in any case, something that happened very late on in the human story. Uh, as you'll see, I think this is quite likely to be illusory, to be a function of visibility and survival of evidence, and that there is good reason to think that interest in marine resources, fishing, shell gathering, uh, sea crossings, goes much deeper and further back in time. So those are the two big themes. Let's look a little bit at um, uh, sorts of models that we might be using as reference. Of course, there is a great deal of research going into the um, origins and spread of, of humans, paleoclimatic evidence, new evidence, genetic evidence, new finds of fossil hominins, stone tools, geochronology, and so on. And I can't possibly do justice to the full range of uh, studies going on. A lot of this work is what I call vertical thinking. It's people trying to work out a sequence through time and to fit the evidence into a chronological sequence through a stratified sequence of sediments or stratified layers and archaeological deposits. My own interest has always been in the horizontal approach, thinking about landscapes, physical landscapes, as a focus to bring together these other uh, studies and to think about the spatial and geographical variability uh, in which people made their living and which may have shaped the long-term evolutionary trajectory. Doing landscape work is very difficult, probably why it's not very common, because ch landscapes change and trying to reconstruct what they were like at some earlier period is very, very difficult. Um, and in fact, if you look at the distribution of early sites and indeed later sites, fossils, archaeological material, they show a very strong association with areas of serious geological instability. Think of the African Rift. Uh, think of coastlines which are vulnerable to sea level change, and so on. And to the extent that people have commented on this, really the question is, is this just a fortuitous outcome of where the evidence is visible and preserved, or is there some more intimate relationship is the actual instability of the landscape and the, the dynamic nature of it implicated in some way as what we might call an agent without intent in helping to drive the uh, patterns of uh, evolutionary change and dispersal? 
Uh, that, of course, leads on to two obvious questions. What sorts of landscapes and resources are attractive or were attractive uh, and either afforded or inhibited expansion into new territory? And to what extent do the landscape dynamics associated with these unstable environments drive evolution by selecting for or against biological and cultural innovations? And at the moment we have two big models on the table uh, and I'll talk about both of them. The first is what uh, we call the tectonic landscape model. This is something that I and my associates have been responsible for developing in the last decade, which is very much focused on the terrestrial side of the equation. I'll call this track one and we'll go down track one for a little bit in this lecture. The other is the coastal dispersal model, which has a somewhat uh, checkered history uh, of intermittent interest, but has suddenly become very popular, uh, particularly in relation to the expansion of modern humans after 150,000. The idea that, that there were new adaptations that helped propel modern humans out of Africa, involving sea crossings, uh, marine resource exploitation, fishing, shell gathering, and so on. The maritime track, track two, and I'll talk about that one as well. A lot of this research has been focused in the last five years by one of these big grants that we have access to now through the European Research Council. Uh, and European funding now gives us access to funding on a scale that is not available anywhere else in the world as far as I can see and is orders of magnitude more than I would ever have expected even 20 years ago. We have one of these. Uh, my co-investigator is a man called Geoffrey King, who's an earthquake specialist and a tectonic specialist, who has a lot to answer for in developing my own thinking. Research students, postdocs, specialists from various parts of the world. It's multinational, multidisciplinary, the usual thing, big project. Uh, that project is a five-year project, 2011 to 2016. It actually ends formally today, 31st of March 2016, so it's a sort of anniversary, but as those of you who run big projects know, the research doesn't stop when the money gets turned off. Um, in fact, it just gets started because now we're into the serious business of digesting the results and publishing them, and that will carry on. So this has been a great driver of, of our own ideas and fieldwork. We've been working in Saudi Arabia, um, in Kenya, other parts of the world. The other network that I got involved in is another European funded uh, financial instrument, as they call it, which is a research network. It gives you money to meet and talk and plan, but not actually to do the research. Quite big money. Uh, kept me very busy for four years. A lot of meetings and workshops, people from all over Europe, um, money for training uh, young researchers to get them interested in this field of research focused on this whole issue of submerged landscapes and the prehistoric archaeology that might be lurking there waiting to be discovered. Splash cost it's called, I, you can see for yourself. Uh, the first trick to getting money out of the European Union is get the acronym. If you've got the acronym then the rest will follow, you hope. Um, so this is very much on the maritime track. Um, and it really the numbers of people involved and the work that we've done have been aimed at trying to develop this as a serious field of research to develop the critical mass because there's still a lot of scepticism about doing this sort of underwater archaeology. Let's start with the dispersed project. Uh, its aims as originally expressed were to explore this idea of the impact of landscape instability on human development and of course to develop a whole suite of new methods for reconstructing landscapes using remote sensing, satellite imagery, underwater mapping uh, and of course the development of the sorts of models of landscape change that inform our understanding of landscape change. And there's no way of escaping the geology here. I'm not a geologist, so I'll keep it simple. But there's a lot of geophysics involved, geophysical models, and people who develop those models with us, and so on. 
and we're looking at or exploring three propositions which on the face of it are counterintuitive. The first is that these unstable landscapes are actually a positive driver or selective agent in the human developmental trajectory. Secondly, that marine and coastal resources have a much deeper history going back into the Pleistocene than convention allows for. And we're moving here from track one to track two. And ultimately, uh, track three, or track two, point three, that these submerged landscapes, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, which are hugely extensive, actually have arguably most of the evidence and the most important evidence of human development over the last million plus years underwater and that we're missing that evidence and therefore missing most of the chapters of human prehistory. That's a big claim. I'll try and justify it uh, as we go along. Let's start with track one. Track one begins here in El Asnam in northwest Algeria uh, in the Atlas Mountains where a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck on October the 10th, 1980, causing massive uh, damage, uh, death and injury, as big earthquakes do. The earthquake itself caused a, a rupture on a pre-existing fault, which created a vertical displacement of three meters, just like that and that fault ran for 25 kilometers across the landscape. And this is all related to the fact that uh, North Africa and the Atlas Mountains are being compressed by the convergence of the African and European plates and the mountains are being pushed up and compressed by that long-term process. Now on the face of it, this is a hugely destructive event something any human population would try to avoid if they possibly could. But the geologists who went out to study the aftermath of this earthquake, and Geoffrey King was one of them, which is how he got interested in archaeology, discovered something else, that the uplift of that fault pushed up a pre-existing ridge or fold. It impeded the drainage of the local river and ponded the water back to create a lake, a new lake. Actually, it was historical records show it had existed you know, decades earlier. And the earthquake rejuvenated that lake. It created and accentuated that mountain ridge or low barrier around the lake basin. And in other words, it actually had a constructive effect, if you think about the consequences in ecological terms and on a longer time scale. And the gravels that were progressively tilted at the edge of the fold contain Mousterian artifacts in them. So clearly this region has been attractive over tens of thousands of years. And there's a very important uh, point buried in this about time scale. The event, the earthquake, is hugely destructive. But in the longer run, that event and others like it in earlier periods and in the future, because this will carry on, actually have a constructive uh, effect in terms of an ecology that is beneficial to human settlement. On a very long time scale, tens of millions of years, of course, we go back to destruction because this whole landscape will eventually get destroyed by the inexorable plate motions. But change the time scale and you see something different. This is a message that goes through a lot of uh, archaeological thinking. Now, at about the same time, uh, in the early 80s, I was involved in a, a coordinating a big project in Greece, which again had a landscape focus. Um, it, I inherited an earlier body of work by my predecessor in Cambridge, Eric Higgs, who was very interested in this sort of landscape approach. 
uh, and excavated the first known Paleolithic sites in Greece, uh, sites like uh, Aspracalico and Kokonopoulos. We went back in the 1980s to continue that work and to complete some unfinished business uh, and to look for new sites and ended up excavating a site called Glithi right up in the mountains. Now the logic of what we were trying to do here was to try and understand the underlying pattern that explained why sites are located in particular parts of the landscape in relation to the movements of animals which, whose bones occur in hundreds of thousands in these sites along with millions of stone tools uh, and how that relates to the whole wider landscape. I should say that when I started this project, I went back to look for the coastal, what I thought was the missing coastal element of the Paleolithic, hoping to find a big cave down on the coast edge. I ended up running an excavation in a rock shelter about as far inland and up a mountain as you can get, which seems a bit paradoxical. But our focus was regional and we came to understand, and already you see the um, submerged landscape showing up there at low sea level, that possibly that landscape was the most important part of the regional uh, settlement pattern. But in any case, we learned something else about this landscape, uh, which is, if anything, more tectonically active than uh, the Atlas region of Algeria, with plates converging and pushing up mountains and subduction in the Aegean which is stretching the crust and creating a, a ring of volcanic activity uh, which includes the um, well-known explosion of the Santorini volcano which destroyed that settlement in the Bronze Age and probably hastened the demise of Minoan civilization. Very active, earthquakes, volcanoes in the south and so on. And it turned out, and this was King who pointed this out to us, we had missed it until he looked at the landscape with the eye of an earthquake specialist, that our Paleolithic sites are located in exactly the same sorts of um, situations as that uh, Algerian example. They are located close to fault boundaries, uh, which are pushing upwards and creating barriers, but also trapping sediments and water in relatively fertile local regions and rejuvenating those features through repeat earthquakes. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, normal faulting, which is when you've got stretching or compressional faulting and reverse faulting. They both create the same sorts of landscape features. So another site, Castritza, that huge fault behind a lake it's been there and has been growing for a million years. Uh, there's an archaeological site called Castritza. Um, uh, Eric Higgs excavated that in 1966 and dug a huge trench with a lovely section, uh, planning to go back and study it in 1967. In the interval, an earthquake destroyed the section. Just makes the point about instability. And that, of course, has given headaches for everyone ever since about interpreting the stratigraphy of this site. But the point here is that this combination of tilting, uh, valley formation, barrier uplift creates and rejuvenates an advantageous set of topographic features which people can take advantage of to control, to monitor uh, movements of animals in particular, which is our particular focus, uh, and so on. And that this is happening both on a big scale at the total region as well as the local scale and creating um, a complex topography which traps these sediments uh, and water supplies in local fertile basins and on a bigger scale creates barriers, ridges or rough disturbed ground that circumscribe animal territories, channel animal movements over larger areas and make it possible for an intelligent predator, i.e. a human hunting group, to gain tactical advantage in accessing prey and hiding from other predators or other human competitors. Without active tectonics, there would be no topography. That's the bottom line. 
erosion would have gradually wear the land surface down to a smooth surface. So there are advantages in this sort of activity. And King persuaded me to write about this in the first paper in 85. Now it wasn't long before we started thinking about what if uh, we go to a much bigger tectonic structure, the African Rift. Is this implicated in some way in human evolution? It's where all the early sites are. And we have um, articulated an argument to that effect. Rift tectonics is a bit different from what we've been looking at. The rift uh, forms through uplift of the flanks, progressive uplift and down dropping of the central valley. There's a lot of volcanic activity. And volcanoes, uh, as you know in this part of the world, have some advantages. Lava flows can create local barriers which add to that topographic complexity. They can create local areas that are safe and protected. Again, the opportunity for taking tactical advantage of that topography is there. Volcanoes create fertile soils, as we know. Uh, crater lakes and so on. So the combination of faulting, rifting, volcanic activity adds to the creation, rejuvenation of this topographic complexity. And we've gone a step further with one of the biological members of the team to suggest that this may um, provide an alternative hypothesis for accounting for how our evolutionary trajectory goes from arboreal to ground dwelling. Conventional view shown here, we start somewhere in the pre-hominin era in the trees um, with thinning out of the forests and climate change. We go through a semi-arboreal phase through various uh, evolutionary trajectories ending up with fully upright walking hominins after two million. This has always seemed to us to be a very problematic sequence. The idea that a relatively unspecialized hominin might successfully create a niche out on the savanna plains, this is a typical time life reconstruction, with just a distant tree to head for to gain protection from predators and other big animals does not seem very plausible and all sorts of arguments have been and ideas have been proposed to overcome this. And there is a fundamental misunderstanding in here about savanna. Savanna is a vegetation type, it's not a topographic category. A lot of savanna is in extremely complex topography it's not all smooth. The bits where all the big game animals hang out and where tourists go to look at them, like the Serengeti or the flanks of Kilimanjaro, are smooth. But that's not where the sites are. They're in the rift. And we have uh, various photographs on the right there showing lava flows and fault barriers and uh, steep topography and so on. The rift, if you actually go and look at it, is a revelation. And if we're talking about a niche that involves regular access to meat, prolonged care of the young uh, with an extended childhood, the meat to feed that growing brain, the extended childhood to extend the period of learning, habitual ground dwelling and so on, the conventional hypothesis does not look, it looks odd. And you think, is, would this work? There's an alternative trajectory and this is where the complex topography comes in, that the transition from arboreal to ground dwelling might have been through uh, complex topography at the edge of these herbivore-rich plains, which created that tactical uh, advantage for protection, for access, uh, and so on. And also selected for some of the anatomical features we associate with ground dwelling in our feet and so on. Sometimes this has been called the scrambler man hypothesis. 
with apologies for the use of the word man. So here's an alternative hypothesis which stems from looking at how people get at animal prey in complex topography. And of course we've tried to generalize this study of roughness. You can use digital elevation models, satellite data, and all sorts of techniques for creating maps that give you proxies of where the complex topography is. And if I was looking uh, at, in this sort of way at how to get from the African Rift to Asia, that would be my favored route. The only problem is the Red Sea, which is a 30 kilometer wide barrier. But we can look at roughness at different scales. The world scale, these are the earliest sites in various parts of Europe and Asia. We can home in at a local scale. A lot of the big Ashalean sites like Olorga Sili, uh, Geshe Benot Yaakov in the uh, Jordan Valley. Big sites repeatedly visited for big animals, elephants and bones of and lots of stone tools. If you look at the location, there in and you reconstruct what the landscape was like a million years ago and you can do this they're in the one unique place in a wider region where animals have to go through in order to get from big grazing territories on either side of the valley okay so far so good and are these sorts of locations uh, remain important in later prehistory. That's track one. One way of thinking about uh, expansion out of Africa. <coughs> Let's go to track two and we'll get on to the marine track. And the big, the big issue here is sea level change. This is uh, the sort of diagram that will be familiar to many of you. This is what we understand to be the the general pattern of sea level change. Uh, you only see here the last 200,000 years, but it's a regular cycle. It goes back further in time. Um, and this has been well known about for several decades. But you can immediately see the problem. That's all we can see today at a period of high sea level. All the shorelines and coastal regions before about 7,000 years ago are missing. They're underwater until you get back to 130,000. Then you've got another period of missing data and so on, back in time. For most of human history, sea levels have been 40 to 130 meters lower than the present. The amount of land that was drowned by the most recent post-glacial sea level rise is estimated at 20 million square kilometers. That's a lot of landscape. And we can construct an argument about why that landscape was probably the most attractive part of the wider region in many parts of the world. Where do most people live today? Where did most people live in the past? At any level of technology or economic sophistication? coastal regions and we're missing most of them for most of prehistory. Here's a different version. Uh, once you think about that it becomes blindingly obvious why shell mounds suddenly appear explosively at about seven, eight thousand years ago. It's because the sh previously the shorelines where they might have existed are underwater. So we're not really talking about a post-glacial revolution, at least we may not be. Then we go back in time to the last period of high sea level. There are a number of big coastal caves around the Mediterranean and Africa with deep sequences that show an appearance of large numbers of limpet shells, fish bones, the odd sea mammal bone at that period. Think of the South African caves. And again, archeologists have seized on this and said, ah, uh, here is the first evidence of uh, the exploitation of marine resources. This is evidence for modern humans who are around at that time developing a new set of adaptations which help to 
develop their spread out of Africa. Maybe, maybe not, because we don't know what was happening in the low sea level period before. We can't take the evidence at face value. Lots of question marks. And if coastal indicators were present during periods of low sea level, we can't see them. Maybe they've gone, they've been destroyed. Certainly they're submerged. Just to add to this sort of coastal theme, there is a growing interest and belief that um, many of the stages of expansion have a coastal signature. Of course, early exit out of Africa may or may not uh, have a coastal theme. It seems to be mainly terrestrial, but remember that we cannot see the uh, now submerged coastal landscapes that these early hominins might have been occupying in their slow spread and expansion into Europe and South Asia. Modern humans uh, may have gone around the coast. There is a big assumption that they went through what is known as the Southern Corridor here around the Indian coastline. And we know, of course, that to get into Australia, they were making sea crossings 50,000 years ago. That is a most significant discovery of world prehistory in the 20th century, possibly one of the most important. Getting into the Americas through the high latitude routes across the Bering Straits, arguably many people are saying must have been coastal because that ice sheet was in the way until about 11,000 years ago. But there was an ice-free corridor along the coastline and any population with seafaring skills and an ability to hunt sea mammals and fish and so on could have come down that coastal route. There's even talk of people spreading from northern Spain to the eastern seaboard of America at about 20,000 years ago following the pack ice, which would have been a lot further south in the Atlantic Ocean, and seal hunting. This is hugely controversial. Um, the Paleolithic uh, students of stone tool typology hate it, but from an ecological point of view, it's possible. Keep an open mind. Into the high latitudes as the ice melted at 10,000 and 4,000 years ago, there is very definitely a, a marine signature. And finally, we talk, look at the Pacific. I've had this map for a long time and used it in many lectures, and New Zealand has been sitting there in splendid isolation in the center of the map uh, at the bottom, ignored. It's time that I put it in its rightful place the whole expansion of populations into the Pacific, the Polynesian phenomenon, is definitely a maritime phenomenon. Now when we're talking about the more recent expansion into the far-flung corners of the world, these are definitely maritime. Whether the uh, spread through the middle latitudes was driven by seafaring and coastal resources remains open to debate. And we're focusing on this particular region to try and open up that discussion. Before I go there, just one question that will always occur to people is to say, OK, you've got a lot of submerged landscape here. This red territory added 40% to the area of Europe at lowest sea level. Is there anything left? There's tons of stuff. Everything from lower Paleolithic hand axes and mammoth bones Neanderthal skulls have been dredged up by trawler fishermen in the North Sea. Uh, Mesolithic settlements with fantastic preservation in the Baltic. Uh, various sites around the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and so on. Uh, we have in our database about 3,000 underwater sites for Europe, ranging in age from Neolithic back to Lower Paleolithic, and in depth from the intertidal zone down to about 130 metres. The stuff is there, um, and it does get preserved in places, so it's worth looking for it. And it's not only sites, it's whole landscapes. This whole field of study is one of, of huge importance now, and there's so much to say about it that it deserves a full lecture to itself. And it will get it, because I'm giving another lecture in two weeks' time. So while I'm touching on this, this underwater coastal theme here, 
I'm going to say more about it if you're here and want to come and listen to me uh, at a lecture in the museum, Auckland Museum, in two weeks' time. But you can look at remote sensing and seismic records produced by old companies. And my colleague Vince Gaffney has driven a fascinating project that will give you detail about the submerged landscape, where the shorelines are, where the topography is, where the river systems are, where the wetlands are, and so on. So there's a lot out there. Let's come back to uh, the Red Sea. There is a genetic story involved here, which is fueling the idea of modern human coastal dispersal. Based on these sorts of genetic maps, that by looking at modern genetic variation in modern populations in different parts of the world, can be used to create a, a, a genetic tree and of course the geneticists claim to be able to date the branching points and indeed to identify the roots of dispersal. This is the conventional idea about spread out of Africa, the land route, the north route, and of course the new or newish DNA synthesis has been around for 10 years now, has argued on the basis of the genetic evidence there was a very rapid dispersal that way at 60,000, not approximately 60,000, but 60,000 involving seafaring, fishing, all those things. Don't believe it. Uh, the genetics cannot give you a date except to an order of magnitude that's so approximate that it's almost, it's not like a radiocarbon date. That 60,000 date is at best. 60,000 plus 100,000 minus 40,000 and is based on the assumption firstly that the rate of change in genetic mutations in the mitochondrial DNA is constant and uniform through time and secondly that you can calibrate it and how do the geneticists calibrate it? They come to us, the archaeologists. They look at the entry of modern humans into Australia about 50, 60,000 they see that that's a, a, you know, a, a calibration point of modern humans. They see that modern humans got into Australia by seafaring. So they extrapolate back and make the assumption that the exit from Africa was also about 60,000 and involved seafaring. It is far beyond their data to be able to identify that. As for the route, well, there are many ways of getting from the genetically measured populations in Africa to those in India. You could go that way. You could go that way because uh, the center of the Arabian Peninsula was green for long periods. You could go in both directions. The story is much, much more complicated and needs some archaeological field data, which is what we're doing. And the first thing we try and do is look at that Red Sea opening and say, could it have been narrower and could it have been easy to cross? And I won't go into all the geophysics, but trying to work out where coastlines were in this part of the world has to take into account at least four tectonic processes. Rifting, flank uplift, down dropping of the valley, ocean spreading because the Arabian plate is now rotating away from and being pushed away from Africa, which is widening the Red Sea. Isostatic loading and unloading of seawater, which also calls flexing and uplift and down warping of coastlines. And just for good measure in the uh, Red Sea, particularly where we're working, salt tectonics. Salt is mobile. Under pressure, it will form these um, mushroom-shaped uh, diapers that push the land upwards and in the adjacent areas you'll get sinkage. So it's a bit of a complicated story. People like Kurt Lambeck can model these things and take account of all these variables and his reconstruction based on the shallowest bit of the Red Sea suggests that for long periods of low sea level getting across the Red Sea would be like hopping across islands with 
sea crossings of no more than two or three kilometers. It's not a big deal. By the way, Farisan Islands, we've done a lot of work are here. They're being pushed up by salt tectonics. All these blue deep holes are where the salt has withdrawn to create deep holes in the landscape. And if people could get across here when sea level was low, this would all be dry land. And this, hugely extensive submerged landscape with potential. Uh, there's another way of looking at sea level uh, paleo coastline change, uh, which involves looking at stable isotope signatures and deep sea cores. Again, I won't go into detail, but it comes up with the same story. That southern end has not been closed. If it had been, salinity would have skyrocketed and you'd see that signal in the isotope record. You don't. So it's always been open, but only quite a narrow opening and quite shallow. And also, again, I'll, I'll simplify what you see on the diagram here. Because of the geometry of the Hanish Sill region, which has very steep sides and then opens out to be very broad, that narrow crossing and that island hopping would have been available at any time when sea level was below 50 meters. And that is for at least 40,000 years during the past 120,000. These are the windows of opportunity. The same going back in time. So the chances that people would get across there without significant seafaring skills, you know, floating, swimming, rafting, I would say is very high, even by accidental um, movement. And quite within the capabilities of pre-modern humans as well as modern humans. And when you get to the other side, you get to a very attractive landscape. Arabia is surprisingly green. We think of it as a desert kingdom. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the notion of a fertile crescent in the north. Well, there's another fertile crescent in the south, which has the added advantage that it's got extremely rich marine uh, resources around it as well. And in the wet season, you've got a green landscape, especially down here. And at certain periods in the Pleistocene, that green landscape extended inland into the desert. There are a lot of sites known, not many are dated. Various teams are now working on this. Um, we are focusing on this region. We are looking on land and underwater. We are looking for early sites on land and looking for sites with dates. We have some sites in the high sea level terrace of 130,000 years ago, it's a coastal expression of the Paleolithic. And of course, in the Holocene we've got over 3,000 shell mounds. Typical dates, 6,000, a lot of excavation, undoubtedly seafaring, fishing with nets, shell gathering, hunting. Loads of them. We've done a lot of work. I won't go into the details. But the big question we ask ourselves, and the shorelines are moving all over the place. Uh, these are the shell mounds on a shoreline that has now been uplifted, so that the modern shoreline is, is here, several kilometers away. Now, all, a lot of these sites are associated with marine undercut terraces. And of course, the big question is could these sites exist underwater? And that's what we set out to look for. First of all, to try and identify these paleo shorelines underwater, and then to see if we could find the archaeology. And again, to cut a long story short, and you'll get the longer story in the, in the next lecture, we've been finding these sorts of features using diving, using uh, mixed gas diving, where people can go down 60 meters or more, using shallow diving, excavating, <coughs> underhangs and so on. And of course we've been doing some uh, uh, mapping in deeper water. The logistics for getting this sort of thing done in the Red Sea are not simple, but we had the big advantage of a Hellenic marine research centre vessel that had been commissioned by the Saudis. They paid for the ship to come from Greece to Jeddah, reduced our costs 
considerably. And this is a, a ship that's equipped with the necessary equipment to do everything that you need to do to do underwater mapping. Multi-beam, sub-bottom, side-scan, seismics, uh, coring of sediments, uh, and a remotely operated vehicle for going and taking photographs. And we worked on two areas that you can see here. And we're beginning to add detail to this otherwise blank area of the map. We're finding archipelagos and valleys down at minus 120 meters at the edge of the glacial maximum shoreline. Valleys connected by uh, broad valleys corrected by narrow gorges, sort of complex topography lots of fault-bounded basins and the coring is telling us something that we didn't really expect. In all the basins with sediment the upper part of the core has marine sediment, of course, that's recent. But you go down the core and you come into lacustrine sediments. There's a transition from lake to marine. And the big question is, is, are those lake sediments formed by in freshwater conditions? I can't give you a full answer to that yet. The analysis is still underway. But we have dates. Um, we have both op OSL optically stimulated dates, we will get radiocarbon dates, that demonstrate that that transition here is taking place at about 18 to 20,000 years ago. So this is evidence that we appear to have a lake district on that exposed shelf. And this is probably the first time that we have evidence to test a very interesting idea that was published some years ago by these people. The coastal oasis theory that underwater springs which exist in the Red Sea and many other parts of the world would have become more active when sea level drops and create a whole series of freshwater areas that would make for an attractive landscape. And again this is uh, a detail that I won't go into much about but you begin to see some of the complexities of the ways in which attractive landscapes oscillate when climate gets wetter in the hinterland, you can expand into the core of Arabia. It's these, uh, the green here. Usually in the first part of the interglacial, between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago, there were lakes in the Rub al-Khali, which is now one of the world's biggest deserts, and so on. When the uh, hinterland becomes arid, sea level often drops at glacial maxima and you get another attractive landscape, freshwater lakes and springs offshore. Unfortunately, the two don't coincide, so this is quite a severe constraint on demographic movements. There's almost no overlap, a little bit here. <coughs> So you have this pulsation movement between the hinterland and the exposed shoreline. And we're still pursuing that and doing new analysis and interpretation. Well, um, like most big projects, we end up with more questions than we started, rather than answers, some answers, and the questions are new questions. But a number of things are beginning to emerge from this study. Can we talk about rapid coastal dispersal in that time range of modern humans zooming out of Africa around the Indian Ocean until they reach um, Australia? With seafaring and marine resources. I can only give you my opinion at the moment. My opinion is no, not as a uniform single process. There are patches of coastline which were probably attractive for 
boating and local seafaring and fishing and so on. They're probably archipelago situations. These are often the most attractive places and we see this in other parts of the world where you get the offshore archipelagos and offshore islands. That is where you get evidence of very early sea crossings and so on. Was the submerged landscape important because of its terrestrial potential? Or because of the marine resources at the edge? Or both? Again, we don't know at the moment. Um, but certainly a lot of prime terrestrial territory would have existed in the coastal hinterland and been attractive and available for early human settlement which is now submerged. We haven't found the archaeology yet, I have to say, in case somebody asks it, as they usually do. That's going to come later. But we're beginning to understand the detail of what the landscape was like, how it changed, what the shorelines were like, what the local variation was like along a coastline. Is complex topography a factor? I made a lot of that earlier on in the lecture, and uh, you can see that the submerged landscapes we've been looking at in the Red Sea are indeed typically complex. Then we get into a whole new set of questions which begin to come into focus. How do people deal with, the, with, with the, a situation where sea level rises and inundates traditional territory? And how do they respond when sea level goes down? And how does that sea level change alter the configuration of topographic features that might be attractive or important? These two go together. Again, these are questions that we can't answer at the moment. We can begin to tackle them. And there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Uh, I am a keen advocate uh, and believer in the significance of submerged landscapes. Studying them is very expensive, logistically complicated, needs lots of money. Um, and there are ways of doing it. Um, especially if the problem is important enough and central enough to the understanding of big questions like human dispersal that you can persuade the funding bodies to give you the necessary funds. A lot of it requires very large-scale collaboration, international, multidisciplinary collaboration with industrial uh, operators who have ships, uh, equipment, and are sometimes very susceptible to doing some archaeology uh, because of the public relations benefits. And of course, if all goes pear-shaped underwater, you should be doing work on dry land and getting results there, if nothing else. One of the biggest questions, and this is quite a technical question, but it's emerging in my mind as central to working underwater and on dry land, is that we still do not really understand or pay enough attention to the ways in which the original distribution and deposition of material evidence, archaeological sites, and so on, is modified in the underwater case by inundation. What features survive, what conditions ensure their preservation, and so on. And the same issue exists on dry land. A lot of processes are affecting the, the land surface that are removing sites from view, changes in cultivation practices, building of roads and houses and settlements, natural erosion at the shore edge, how many shell middens in New Zealand have now disappeared that once existed, and so on. These are big questions, and they focus on what is perhaps the most difficult issue in this whole range of studies, is how do we disentangle a pattern that is simply the product of differential preservation and differential visibility from a pattern that is a genuine expression of variations in human activities through time and space. That's on the agenda. It needs researching, uh, and it needs researching on dry land and underwater. So this is the point where I should certainly stop. 
Um, there's a lot more to say. Some of it I will talk about on another occasion. And there's a great deal more research and another few million euros of money that need to be spent on the next stage. And we're working now on how to raise that funding. Inevitably, lots of people involved in contributing to the success of our work, funding-wise and permit-wise and logistics-wise. So, thank you very much. That is the end.